51 for next week. Okay, Sylvia. I did let's, it. Let's uh, roll. I did it. All right, we are in Getting to Know Jesus, Lesson 150 in Volume 12. Wow. And we're all going to switch mics here. I'm going to turn that one on, turn that one on, get it out of my way. Sometimes I don't like that thing in my face. That one is. <laughs> but this one here, uh, this will work good enough. Okay, we're at lesson 112, or lesson 150 on pages 51 to 64. Our Bible text is pages 52 to 55, and our lesson notes are on pages 56 to 62. Jesus is condemned. They've been going through the trial. We're getting to the end of it now. Has it seemed like it's gone and taken a long time to get through this? Think what it would have been if you were Jesus wow. and you hadn't had any sleep all night long. We're going to talk tonight about when wickedness prevails. So here again is our timeline. We're right down here at the bottom. We've been through the entire life of Christ. We're getting ready to wrap it up. We are on Lesson 150, to trial before Pilate, Herod, and then back to Pilate. This is where we are right now. And he's about to head off to Calvary carrying that wood tree. So this is really beginning to hurt. <clears throat> I mean, how much pain can a person endure before they say, enough? You've been there. Every one of you have been there one time or another. Emotionally, physically, uh, maybe spiritually and intellectually, you've gotten to something that hurt. You finally said, this is enough. And somebody got a bloody nose, or they got talked to, or, or something got changed. How much emotional stress and mental anguish can one tolerate even when his friends and followers turn away and run away in fear? But this is what's happened to Jesus. Why is it that we are so quick to abandon someone being unfairly treated when we are responsible in part for their humiliation? When is evil going to be defeated and good prevail for all mankind? And we look at the things that are going around us here today just in the United States. And of course, most of you are aware of things that are going away on in Pakistan and Israel, Sudan, uh, even this afternoon in Canada uh, and other places, uh, which makes some of the stuff we're going through kind of mild in comparison. But how much before we say enough? We're in Matthew chapter 27, verses 32, uh, 23 to 32, Mark 15, verses 14 to 21, Luke 23, verses 23 to 26, and John 19, verses 8 to 17. And Jesus is just about through the trials. We can call it a kangaroo court or a monkey trial, because that's a little more of what he got during the night by the Sanhedrin. The sun is now up. Friday morning. It's approaching 9 o'clock Friday morning. <clears throat> and just for a letter of reference, by 9 o'clock, his hands are stretched out like that and nails put through them and nails put through his feet and he is suspended between <clears throat> heaven and earth. Soon he'll be carrying his cross to Calvary. Now, this has to be emotionally draining on him. On top of the physical lack of sleep, the verbal abuse, the flogging, and all the other mockery that's gone on and still going on, yet he maintains his course. He does not steer away from allowing those men to crucify him for their sins. How can evil people be so cruel and not see their evil for what it is? Uh, some of you have heard the news of children uh, in... Well, I can't think of what country now. Syria. Syria. Uh, I think it is Syria. Being basically taken from their families and told to deny Jesus or die. Did you see that email? And they're killing these children because they won't deny Jesus. Even in their childlike, I don't know any better, or I'm too, too I know about Jesus and, and, and I don't want to turn my back on it, whatever. They're dying for their faith. Their mom and dad. Can you imagine mom and dad's feelings? At least my child died for their faith. But what parent wants to see their child brutally, horrifically murdered? 
Well, Father God is looking down on earth right now. And what are they, they, oops, wait a minute, what are we doing to His Son? Let's talk about the power struggle between good and evil. Matthew chapter 23 verse B, Mark 4, 5, chapter 15 verse 14 B, Luke 23 verse 23 B, and John 19 verses 8 through 15. And that's over on page 52 in your book if you want to follow along there. <coughs> When Pilate heard this, he was even more afraid. And he went back inside the palace. Where do you come from? He asked Jesus. But Jesus gave him no answer. Do you refuse to speak to me? Pilate said. Don't you realize I have the power either to free you or to crucify you? Jesus said that you would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. Therefore the one who handed me over to you is guilty of the greater sin. And if you don't like our leaders, the one who voted for him... On a tangent there, but stay on course here. From then on, Pilate tried to set Jesus free. But the Jews kept shouting, If you let this man go, you are no friend of Caesar. Anyone who claims to be a king opposes Caesar. Now, when Pilate heard this, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judge's seat at a place known as the Stone Pavement, which in Arabic is Gabbatha. It was the day of preparation of the Passover week, about the sixth hour. So it's approaching nine o'clock in the morning. Here is your king, Pilate said to the Jews. But they shouted all the louder. They insistently demanded, take him away, take him away, crucify him. And their shouts prevailed. <laughs> Pilate is allowing the priest and the assembled Jewish mob, and that is the correct word there, to intimidate him. Instead of standing for good, he's cowering and giving in to their evil desires. When the priests threaten him that if he does not crucify Jesus, he's no friend of Caesar, it is like the last chance to free Jesus has failed. Martha? You know what's interesting about that is Pilate having all those men under his command, having tortured and killed thousands of Jews, um, and took over their treasury from their temple, and yet he's allowing them to dictate to him. Oh, and look at the pressure. Look at the pressure they're using on him. I know, but still he could have them all killed. And then he would never know it. Pilate is already kind of walking a thin line with Rome. And so all they got to do is just send back to Rome and say, Hey, your Pilate did this. And Pilate knows that his kingdom is done. I don't understand. That's not what I Why the Jews not... You and I are not that much unlike them. There are some things which it's my way or the highway. I see it. Don't confuse me with the facts. My mind's already made up. And this is the state of the mind of the Jews. Don't go back and study the Old Testament prophets and examine and see whether Jesus fulfilled those prophecies. That's the state of the mind of the Jewish people today. We saw that when we were there in Jerusalem. They only read the first five books of the Old Testament. They don't even look at the prophecies. Right. Basically, you are forbidden to read the prophecies and to read the Psalms. And they don't call Jesus Shua. They call him Shu, which is a Hebrew curse. Curse. But that's a little bit off subject. Well, not that far off subject because this is the attitude of these Jews right here. These few Jews in front of Pilate right now. No, Roman Catholics are not identical to that. No. They, uh, they say the same uh, no. charisma, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. They, they believed in their own devout... Uh, well, but, they believe but they I can take it. you down to the Baptist, the Assembly of God, the Pentecostal, the Independent Christian Church, <laughs> and I can point out a dozen, if not a million more, just like that. It has nothing to do with which church you belong to. It has a, the attitude Ooh. that some of us sometimes get in Ooh. ourselves. I think one thing that has to be understood is that Jesus came for a purpose and that his purpose wouldn't be thwarted anyway. And in Romans 11 it says that the Jews had a veil over their eyes. Oh, That's right. Right. The Jews could not yep. see because the purpose of God had to be fulfilled. And that veil is still over their eyes right. until they take a step towards their Messiah Jesus. Then the veil is lifted from them 
and they see Jesus then they, if they will take one step and examine the prophecies and see if Jesus fulfilled them, the veil will be taken away. But how many Christians, how many people have been Christians for years are running around in our churches today with a veil over their eyes? Oh, that's right. Yeah. You don't know what you don't know about Jesus until you start studying His life and find out, oh, I never realized that before. <coughs> And so you folks are being enlightened, not because I'm so great, but because Jesus is it's a life-changing words that we're looking at here. Now, Pilate brings Jesus out and he taunts his accusers by declaring Jesus as their king. Here is your king. <coughs> Jesus has been up all night. Just an hour or so ago, he was severely beaten, 40 lashes, 39 lashes. And he's now badly bruised, a very weak human being and very humiliated. It's approaching 9 o'clock in the morning. He's looking beyond his humiliation. Though. Yeah. And he maintained his course right. for you. Yeah. And you. Amen. And you too. It is tragic to see how so many people are intimidated when some well, with evil intentions, intimidates good people into submission or scares them from doing anything to stop evil. Considering some of the atheistic and, and uh, uh, activist groups that are going on today, trying to stop Christianity, freedom of speech, trying to tell us what we can or cannot believe. And Christians have been intimidated. We kind of, back when the abortion uh, was coming to issue, the ACLU was reared up in the 30s and 40s and 50s, <coughs> Christians were just, ah, they're not hurting anybody. Just kind of leave them alone. They'll leave us alone and everything will be okay. And now all of a sudden we're realizing that our lives, our beliefs, our freedom is in jeopardy. And we're saying, hey, this is foul. And fortunately, some Christians are standing up and stepping up and more need to do so. Gangs are often outnumbered. But because of their tendency towards violence, they can keep an entire community from stepping up to stop them. Consider some of the Sharia law that's going on in the United States in violation of the Constitution, and the police are afraid to go in there and do anything about it in some of those neighborhoods, or over in England, or in this case in Canada. There are a few religious leaders who are motivated an entire assembly to demand the execution of a man who has only done kind things. Tell me one bad thing that Jesus did. No, you can't. Jesus only did good. Christianity as a religion has brought good to the world and yet there are people who violently want to oppose, suppress, and silence Christians. And that's part of the battle we're fighting here. The power struggle between good and evil. We will always struggle against evil. And it will take strength and integrity to win this war. So no matter where you are or what you're doing, you're tired of fighting. But you cannot put down your arms. You cannot cower in a corner. You cannot climb into your closet and be silent or you will lose the war. Morgan, you had a comment. Uh, I just wonder, you know, you're talking about what the Muslims are doing. <coughs> the mayor of Houston, an openly gay or yeah, lesbian yeah, mayor, mayor, has ordered the at least five pastors to submit all their mm -hmm. all their sermons and all this stuff. Which we is can't definitely against unconstitutional. All of them. It's yeah. very unconstitutional. Fortunately, Christian law firms have jumped into that. <laughs> you, you you got a dog in a fight now. Because Christians are more and more realizing that we must stand up and speak up before we get shut up. <clears throat> well, let's go on. We can spend a whole lot of time there. This rock was rather significant. Uh, this is the King of Fools game. These markings on the floor were used by the Roman guards when persecuting, mocking, or punishing criminals. <coughs> it's very likely that Jesus endured the same kind of mockery before he was led away to be crucified. Are you actually went there and took the picture? Huh? He actually went there and took the picture. I took that picture. <laughs> We've been there. That is the first Glenn and Sylvia picture that's been publicly displayed in the Getting to Know Jesus Bible Study Series. More to come. Now, uh, how does that game? Uh, it's called the King of Fools game. I have no idea how it's played. 
<laughs> I don't know anything about the rules. Parker Brothers didn't come out with it, so there's no real book with it. So, or if they did, they lost the instructions a long time ago. Well, hatred takes responsibility. Matthew 27, 24 through 26, Mark 15, 15, and Luke 22, 3, 23 through 25. When Pilate saw that it was getting nowhere, but instead an uproar was starting, he took water and washed his hands in front of the cloud and said, I am innocent of this man's blood, he said. It is your responsibility. And all the people answered, let his blood be on us and on our children. And it was. <laughs> so Pilate decided to grant their demand. Now wanting to satisfy the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas to them. Remember we talked about that last week? Yeah. A man who had been thrown into prison for insurrection, for murder, the one they asked for. You know, you know it's interesting, too, that Pilate would use a Jewish custom washing his hands because he didn't want the blood on his hands. That was a Jew Jewish that custom. That was a Jewish custom. Yeah. No, he knew enough about their customs. I mean, he, he, he is rubbing this in their faces. Yeah. You guys may be pressuring me into doing something that's wrong. <clears throat> Something I really don't want to do, and I'm not man enough to stand up and say, no, we're not going to do this. But I'm going to, here is your king. Here is your king. I'm rubbing it in your face. <laughs> Hatred takes responsibility. When Pilate introduces a bruised and injured Jesus as their king, the Jews cry out, crucify him. They hate Jesus so much that they declare falsely that they have no king but Caesar. And they're so adamant that Jesus be crucified that they volunteer responsibility for his blood to be put on them and their children. Pilate sees that he's losing this battle of wits. And it gives into their demands and has Barabbas released. As we continue the battle, evil people are bent on doing evil things and they take no thought about the consequences, especially in the passion of the moment. And there have been times when you've been caught up in the passion of the moment. Now, I don't know whether you did something evil or just something really not nice, but you've been caught up in the passion of the moment, and you think about it later on, you say, Christy? That sentence right there reminds me of four people. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, every one of us can think of somebody. At, but here, at Christy, <clears throat> does that sentence ever remind you of you? Not me. Oh. <laughs> of course not. Well, I'll tell you something. It reminds me of me sometimes. And if we're all honest of ourselves, right. we've probably been there one time or another. Yeah, if we I remember. have my younger age, but I don't you remember go. too much. There you go. I can't remember it. You're honest yeah. Yourself. Sometimes we don't think about the consequences until, whoops, I wish I had not done that. Mm. The selfishness of their sin hinders objectivity or reason. In their attempt to pursue their sinful behavior, they lose any discretion as to whether what they are doing is right or wrong. I don't care whether it's right or wrong. I'm going to do it because I do it. They simply want to pursue their selfish agenda to its full end. And they will deal with any consequences after they've accomplished the crime that they are in the midst of. So how many guys get arrested or gals get arrested, caught in the act of committing a crime, and they stand in front of the judge and say, I'm not guilty. I know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Denial is not a river in Egypt. Richard? We had a group in school Orlando. They put some surveillance cameras up there. And, uh, and somebody told the parents that you caught your kids using dope on campus. Oh, not my son. No, not my son. <laughs> yeah. not my son. Then they showed a video, video clip of, of the student. Well, how snoopy big brother can you get? I mean, people should have a little privacy, and now all of a sudden, the parents are dead. first of all, not my kid. Now, the parents are, well, you're being a snoop. Yeah. You know, back when you and I were young grade school, <coughs> high school kids, we got in trouble. Whose fault was it? Ours. Ours. Yeah, it was my fault uh -huh. that I got in trouble. Yep. Nowadays, it's the teacher's fault, regardless of how. That's right far removed the teacher was from the situation. And they have some good teachers, I'm telling you. They get abused because the parents yeah. will not accept the responsibility for their fault 
and they will not accept the responsibility that their children may not be perfect. Appeasement only works temporarily. Let's deal with that for just a minute. Matthew 27, verse 26 to 31, Mark 15, 15 to 20, Luke 23, 25, and John 19, verses 16 and 17. But he, Pilate, had Jesus flogged and handed him over to their will to be crucified. Then the governor's soldiers led Jesus away to the place, into the praetorium, uh, and gathered the whole company of soldiers around him. They stripped him, put a scarlet robe on him, and twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on his head. So all this up time, before the Sanhedrin, no crown of thorns, no purple robe. Before Pilate the first time, no crown of thorns, no purple robe. Before Herod, they abused him, they put a purple robe on him for a while, but they must have taken it back home. But no crown of thorns. Pilate finally says, okay, you guys, get him ready for crucifixion. Now they put the purple robe on him. They put the crown of thorns on his head. The praetorium is that room where that little game of fool, king of fools game was played. That is supposed to be the place where this took place. Uh, in Jerusalem, you'll see one place was where Jesus was flogged. About 50, 60 feet away from that is another church where Pilate condemned him to death. What is that word? Pray. Praetorium? Yes. That is the name of the official building there in Jerusalem where I guess the soldiers were, were held or stayed in that area. Um, part of the government structure there in Jerusalem. Oh, it's like the White House was. No. I wouldn't put it like the White House, but maybe like one of the halls of Congress or one of the congressional buildings the White House. there, oh, or, or maybe an armory or something like that. I don't want that but I don't well, they put a staff in his right hand, and they knelt in front of him, and they called out to him, Hail, King of the Jews! They said again and again, they struck him on the head on that crown of thorns. They well, spit on him. With a, they struck him on the head with a staff and they spit on him. They took the staff and hit him on the head and they fall into their knees. They paid homage to him again and again. I don't know how long this went on. Longer than you think it should have gone on. <coughs> After they had mocked him, they took off the robe and they put his own clothes back on him. I have something to say. Which was a little surprise. Hang on, let me finish this up real quick. So the soldiers took charge of Jesus, carried his own cross, and they went out, led him out, to crucify him. Christy? Isn't that, it's somewhere, I think, it's Isaiah 53. It's all description of all of this, <coughs> fulfilling the prophecy from Isaiah, uh, you will not recognize him. Well, very likely, by the time they got done beating on him and all the abuse that he went through, he was not the same good uh, normal looking guy, you can imagine how you would feel if you've been given 40 lashes, you've been up all night, you've been suffered the verbal abuse, you've got the blood scratches, uh, wounds from the crown of thorns on your head and, and all this other stuff, so yes. Yeah. Actually, I took a picture of a thorn bush while we were there in Jerusalem. The thorns are about that long. You can go over to family Christian stores and sometimes they will have one there woven crown of thorns, which would have been the same kind of thorns they used on Jesus. And yeah, that, that was... Uh, uh, not roses, right? Not, not little rose thorns. No, no, no. Thorns about that long. Oh my God. Wasn't it an acacia bush or something like that? Uh, I think it was. Yeah. Uh, as we were walking up to the top of the Mount of Olives, we saw one. I took a picture of it because mm -hmm. that's the thorns. Probably a lot like a lemon tree, a thorn, or a lot like a bougainvillea. But it was more of a bush than a tree. But uh, yeah, appeasement only works temporary. Pilate thinks that having Jesus flogged will be sufficient to shame the people into not insisting on his crucifixion. Now whether this is the same flogging referred to in the previous verse, 149, that we talked where he was given the 39 lashes, or whether this is another flogging, I don't know. What's clear is that any attempts to prevent Jesus from being crucified are now set aside. There's not going, to, not going to be any more trying to stop him from being taken to Golgotha. The sight of Jesus, even after his flogging, is not enough to appease the crowd. 
they still demand that he die on the cross. And again, the Roman soldiers take special delight in mocking and striking a Jew, especially one who's supposed to be the king of the Jews. Now, let's get this in perspective. The Jews don't like the Romans ruling over them. And the Romans don't like the Jews because they're a real pain in the side, kind of like the Arab guard of the Jews today. Pardon me for making that comparison, but that's just about what it is. Now, fortunately, most Jews did not resort to terrorism, and most of the Arabs don't either, but few do. But the Roman attitude, uh, the, the, the animosity between the two, and they have to coexist with each other. And so to Romans, to have a king of the Jews, uh, you can imagine that, that they would just really just kind of take a little bit of gloating in punishing Jesus and treating him the way they're treating him. I don't understand something. What's that? Why was Rome in Israel? Rome had conquered the known world. Just like Greece had conquered the known world, Rome took it over for G Greece, and Rome conquered. We covered this in lesson number two and three. No, lesson number one. Walking with Jesus. Come back in January when we start over, and uh, you'll get it. You'll learn why. That, uh, but Rome was in control of basically the known world at that time. And the Jews especially didn't like it. Yeah, yeah just, just to bring more to perspective too, it wasn't all the people that no. were shouting crucify him. Most right. of the people were sympathetic to Jesus. Most of them, mm -hmm. A lot of them loved him, a lot of them cared for him because of the things he'd done and such as that. It was only this minority group, this hierarchy yeah. of the Jews and the those that followed after them, those that yeah. wanted the, the blessing, I guess you might have, the hierarchy and the, Jew, Jew, the uh, Romans together. These were the ones that were doing this, uh, that to Jesus, which shouldn't have been done. But the most of the people were sympathetic to Jesus. Having been in Jerusalem and seen how small the old city of Jerusalem is, if all of the Jews that came for Passover were within the city walls, it would be pretty tight in there. Yeah. It's not that big of a space. And if all of them crowded in and around the area of the praetorium for Jesus to be mocked, well, even then, only a few hundred, uh, maybe a thousand at the most, would be able to see and hear what's going on and yell back at Pilate, crucify him. So most of the Jews are home asleep or getting ready for the day, doing whatever they're normally doing, and are not a part of this mob. So if we want to go to Israel today, we have to keep our lips lit that we are not Christians. Well, you get with a Christian tour group and, and you just kind of follow along with the group. If you're out there alone, yeah, you might want to be a little careful what you say. But if you're with a group, uh, it is really a very safe place, uh, generally overall. We can talk about that. We'll talk about more of that on Sunday. Huh? Stay away from 12-year-old pickpocket. Stay away from 12-year-old pickpocket. Well, let's get back here. Sorry. That's okay. After a brief period of mockery and worship of humiliation... Jesus is dressed back in his own clothes and led off to Calvary. Now, when a person or a group of people is bent on doing something evil, there is little that will stop them short of a show of force. Only a show of force would have stopped this from happening. And Jesus had the power. He could have called 10,000 angels. And that would have outnumbered this crowd that was going out to crucify him. Actually, one angel would have been enough. But he didn't. And even then, the force threat of them will only detour, the, the, of a force, the force threat to them will only detour them for a short time until they find some other way to do their evil deed or sufficient forces applied to persuade them that they should not push any further. Consider 9-11. And all the terrorist attacks that had happened against Americans up to 9-11. And a show of force. Back when Gaddafi uh, committed his act of terrorism under the Reagan administration. Reagan put a little uh, bomb down his chimney and he said, Oh, please don't hurt me, please don't hurt me, I'll be nice now. And it stopped. And when Bush decided, You messed with the U.S. and you don't mess with us, and we put a stop to it. And it, it hasn't totally stopped it, we've got more coming back at us. But I learned when I was in high school and you got bullied, the only thing that stopped the bully 
is a punch in the face. Force. And basically, sometimes we as Christians even have to use a little force to protect our rights. Fortunately, we've got courts that generally, sometimes, will understand our rights and, and protect them, and then some don't. Pilate had an army to stop the Jews, but he was afraid to use it. In most situations, force must be met with force. Trying to appease only encourages and emboldens the evildoer to push for more or whatever they, for whatever they're trying to do. A uh, case in point would be, uh, you, could, you could probably go back and cite millions of examples through history. One example that comes to my mind is North Korea. They'd say, you do this or else. And we would say, oh, if we do this, you'll be nice. And they'd say, yeah, okay, we'll be nice. And we'd be nice to them. And then they'd come back and say, you do this or else. And we'd say, oh, if we do this, will you be nice? And the same thing's going in Israel. Mm -hmm. Israel gave up the West Bank mm -hmm. in hopes that Palestine would be nice. Mm -hmm. Palestine doesn't want that. the West One Bank. Land. The Palestine or the Arabs want Israel genocide, yeah. Yeah. death. And so all that Israel has tried to do to seek peace has been met with terrorism and opposition and force. Actually, the Arabs are very peace-loving people. They want a piece of Jerusalem, a piece of the United States, a piece of your backyard. Yeah. Of, they want a piece of the United piece States of right now, too, from uh, 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 the tip of Maine people. to the southern tip of California, from uh, uh, northern west corner of Washington down to the tip of Florida and everything in between. Mm -hmm. so I don't, I don't think that's that another Israel, subject. I don't think that Israel should have given it one iota of their land. I will Not second that ever. thought, but we got to go on. So I, I you agree. Second, that's all I and maybe hear. they'll get it back. I don't know. God's in charge of that. I've got to deal with this. Evil <laughs> doesn't care who it hurts. Matthew 27, 32, Mark 15, 21, Luke 23, 26. As they were going out, they met a man, see Simon of Cyrene in North Africa. His name was Simon, the father of Alexander and Rufus, and was passing by on his way from the country, and they forced him to put the cross on him and made him carry the cross behind Jesus. Now, those of you that watched The Passion of the Christ saw Mel Gibson have him and Jesus carrying the cross together. This says that Jesus had had enough by that time. He was so weak. He was so bruised. He was so injured and so tired, he couldn't even carry it. <laughs> Simon carried it behind him. Jesus, yeah. <coughs> well, it took every energy source out of him now. Do what? It took every sort of energy out of him. It's like well, yeah, he, he's very weak. He's got to be very physically weak by now. And probably pretty emotionally weak. And, and not spiritually weak. Not at all. <coughs> but he is hurting. <coughs> Especially when you consider what you and I did to put him there. Yeah. Evil doesn't care who it hurts. As Jesus is carrying his cross to Calvary, a man named Simon, who is a Cyrene of northern Africa, is headed into Jerusalem. And because being all night without sleep and having verbally been assaulted for hours, no food, most likely no water, and now having been flogged, Jesus is very weak. Uh, on the one side, this will help hasten his death a few hours to a few hours instead of a few days. Some guys being crucified would hang there three, four days before they'd finally die. Jesus won't do that. On the other hand, he's too weak to carry his own cross, so Simon is forced to carry it instead. Now, the normal custom is to have the criminal carry his own cross to humiliate and shame him for the crime for which he's being punished. This would be a deterrent to crime. You are going to be let out. You're going to carry the cross saying, I'm a bad guy, I'm a bad guy, I'm a bad guy. And the people are going to probably mock the abuse on you. You bad guy, you bad guy, you, you'll get what you deserve. Die, you terrible person. I wonder how many of them were saying that to Jesus. Many a time, someone in the midst of committing a crime or doing something that is evil will turn to innocent bystanders and harm them as well. Right. You ever notice? How many drive-by shootings? The person that is injured or killed was uh, 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 not the person that they really were trying to target. They may well be trying to eliminate witnesses or they may simply be so angry and caught up in their crime that they're committed that they don't stop to consider whether the bystanders 
that they are hurting have any rights. Some evil is a lashing out of anger and rage that is not at a specific target, but will vent itself on anyone who is within range of that person who is perpetrating the evil. And that sounds like the situation that happened in Canada. The guy walked up to the first uniformed soldier, killed him, went up after another one who was fortunately armed, although they normally aren't, and this person was able to shoot back and kill the uh, terrorist before he can hurt anybody else. So we'll get into a discussion of why you should be armed to protect your freedom another time. Amen. Well, our conclusion is this. Don't side with evil. It lies, it cheats, and hurts others. It will ultimately lose. Next week, Jesus is nailed to the cross to die for our sins. Join us as we hear his last words. And we're going to break up, turn over to page 63 in our book for our discussion groups, and have some discussion time. You can follow us and stay in touch with what is happening with the Getting to Know Jesus Bible Study Ministry on Plaxo, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, and watch our video clips on YouTube and GodTube. Getting to Know Jesus is sponsored by New Hope Gospel Ministries. If you'd like to follow along with us and start your Getting to Know Jesus Bible Study group, or just pray for us or support our ministry, you can go to www.gettingtoknowjesus.org and find all the information that we have available for you. If you look at the lower right-hand corner, there's a button where you can make a safe and secure donation to the Getting to Know Jesus Bible Study Ministry. Or you can go to the order page and order your Getting to Know Jesus books for your Bible study group. Thank you for stopping by and keep us in your prayers and let us know how we can pray for you.